This is John Reed, and I am joined by two familiar guests. We had such a intense and interesting conversation before. I've got Josh Greenbaum and Jeff Scott. How you doing? I'm good. Doing well. Yeah. Hello, Josh. Hello, John. Yeah. It was such a good one, uh, such a great conversation last time, John. I, I feel like I'm worried that we're not going to live up to the expectation, you know, that second time around it's less inviting and less interesting well we're gonna see i mean i i think that the core topic of the future of sap innovation and what that means for customers is still a hot potato issue so that that's good for us that's good for that's good for uh our viral statistics our vanity metrics but the thing is that we've we've been through a lot since then and i think I think we have clarified some things along that journey, but we're not going to start with that topic because what I what I want to do first, we've all gone through a lot of travel this fall. Um, mm. Both of you have made the pilgrimage to Waldorf, for example, since I think we last talked, um, and 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 we've been to a ton of events. And then there's ASUG Tech Connect on the ground in New Orleans, which I want to talk about to start out with. So what we're going to do first is kind of walk through kind of what we've learned since our last conversation, and then and then we'll revisit that SAP innovation talk. So. And and I think, John, I have the cold and the other ailments that go along with this notion of traveling all the time. So I, yeah. I've got the, both the tire tread and the miles under the tires and the, the, the impact to my health, but I'm better now. I got the Thanksgiving week to recharge and, and be able to talk again. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And what, what I was so excited about in New Orleans with you and Josh at ASUG Tech Connect is I got to have dinner with you. Yeah, we and actually I got to go to the House of Blues after that, and that was yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, you went to the House of Blues, John. Yeah, I got yeah. John. I got John got under un, under protest. He said, "I'm not going." And I said, "How how hard can this be?" And the next time, the next time I saw him at House of Blues, he was enjoying himself, and I thought, "Yes, success." Well, we walked into a kick-ass cover of Superstition by Stevie we Wonder, did. so it's they did a nice hard. job that night. It's kind of hard yeah. to knock that. Anyhow, uh, uh, enough of the <laughs> enough of that banter. So, so on on the on the ASA Tech Connect side, I, I think what was important there was we we discussed the evolution of that event a little bit last time on the podcast. Yeah. But what was important there was, I th- I think there's this collective sense not just in the SAP community, but definitely in the SAP community of the urgency of current situations. And, you know, that includes the S4 HANA and, and, and a maintenance deadlines that includes the impact of AI, that includes the macroeconomic headwinds that we always read about during the earnings calls and stuff. There's a lot going on for, for customers, right? And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I think that kind of explains a little bit why all these SAP tech leaders converged upon an event that had never existed before. And yet there was clearly a need for it, right? Like there was a, it wasn't just the amount of people that were there. It was the urgency of those conversations, right? Uh, John, a hundred percent, right? When we sat down with SAP and discussed kind of this event and how it fit and why it fit and how did the puzzle piece come together, right? Tech Ed was going to be in Bangalore. There was a virtual component of it. And we felt from an ASUG point of view that we needed to have something in North America that people could attend and have face-to-face conversations, ask questions that we say you can do virtually, but you really can't do all that effectively, and learn from each other in a peer-to-peer environment. And on those fronts, I would call this an amazing home run, right? We had 700 customers there. We had great conversations, 130 sessions, uh, feedback from the customer community, feedback from SAP, feedback from the partners was thumbs up. We had a wonderful time, and I think that's exactly mission accomplished, achieved. And I think everyone walked away feeling they they understood a little bit better where these strategies were going, how to get stuff done, how to solve problems, how to get ready for 2024. Bingo. Yay. And and I'll add, I think, you know, and I hope this is true, but I think we made an impression uh, or the event made an impression on on SAP and and, and everyone else that, you know, what we're seeing is the soft power. Of the SAP market, you know, there's a lot of sort of yeah. you know, hardcore. Let's get in there and sell tech and buy s- software and you know lay it down, lay it down on the infrastructure we've got. And then there's this, like I said, the soft power of the market, this ability to connect, this ability to find your peers, this ability to rub elbows. And and like many people said, and you just mentioned, Jeff, you know, it was great to actually have someone ask a real question to face to face. And I think that soft power, I hope that that sense of uh, of its value is going to, you know, going to really permeate, if you will, the 
2024 and beyond as well. Yeah, Josh, we did not do this to benefit SAP, right? We did this to benefit the customer community. Now, obviously, we needed SAP to be all in. And by the way, they were all in. The amount of, you know, we do as ASUG, we do both, you know, Sapphire now and ASUG annual conference and these other events in in collaboration and partnership with SAP. We've been doing this for 18 years. We know how to do this with SAP. And but the level of collaboration, the level of partnership with them and the partners was like beyond anything that I've seen in quite some time. And candidly, that was energizing. It was inspirational to the people that worked on this event, put the content together. And it also made it fun for everyone involved. And I think when you put those pieces together, that's what made this so wonderful. And for those of you listening today who were not in New Orleans three weeks, three East weeks ago, uh, you know, first week of November, uh, you missed something really special. And we'd love to have you in for 2024, five and six. So. You know, that I think, you know, not only did we do it once, John and Josh, we as ASUG will do this again in the subsequent years uh, because we think it is important that the customers come together and discuss these really important topics. Right. And and I want to um, just get a little bit grouchy on that. But 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 I do want to say before I get grouchy that get th- grouchy. there was a lot of content published on on the conference, too. So if you missed it, there's a lot of stuff on ASUG.com you can check out and also I wrote some extensive reviews and, and you guys Josh, did a great job and Josh did as well. Yeah. Um, we so, loved having you there. And, and by and, the way, mark your calendars, Josh and John, 24, 25, 26. Yep. More marked. More, 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 more John, yep. more time in Indeed. House of Blues with Jeff. Indeed. And, and, and Josh, Josh you have to, Josh, scoot, Josh scooted out. So people are like, why wasn't Josh invited? Josh was invited. Yeah, Josh, Josh I'm going home. Josh Bale, but we'll get yeah. more disappointing. Yeah, if you, in case you didn't read that blog post where I was like traveling for three and a half weeks solid. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, Josh. I was, little, I was a little beat, but um, oh. no, but I'm sorry, Jeff. I did not, I, you know, had I known, I would have, um, I would have joined you, I think, maybe. We would have loved to have had you. Anywho, so, but I, I got to get back on topic here around my grouchy part, which trying is trying to pull that, you off topics to avoid yeah. your grouchy part. Well, the grouchy part is that this doesn't, solve sort of a more profound problem. This is a really good event, but it doesn't solve a more profound problem around sort of SAP tech ed going forward and the problem of upskilling of a wide range of developers, Huge. both ABOP developers and also developers who are new to SAP. And and so there's some, and there's, there's also this controversial thing around the future of SAP events that, that Josh also blogged on. I want to get to that in a few minutes. So, so there's a lot of unresolved stuff in, and I just wanted to make it clear to the listeners that this particular event was not meant to substitute for, it, it's not a new US SAP tech ed, okay? Like no. the future of the future of SAP tech ed, both in the US and internationally is a different conversation than this. So this, this represents, I think, part of a go forward answer, but I think there's more to it. But for now, I want to park that because what I want to talk about first is the customer sentiment on the ground and what we heard from customers who showed up. And, you know, I I don't think it's really any surprise, like when Josh and I did our little decoding SAP session, when we took a handful, I don't think it's any surprise that, uh, that, that there was more urgent interest around S4 than artificial intelligence because I asked the attendees to choose and about it was like 98% more for S4 than AI. Having said that, the generative AI session that SAP put on that afternoon was well attended. It's not like customers weren't interested in that topic, but clearly, you know, S4 was overriding concerns. So it was really interesting to hear those conversations and then on the AI side to hear customer feedback around the challenges as well as the opportunities there, right? And the challenges, of course, go back to Josh's wheelhouse around data. So what what is your take on what you heard from customers in terms of what they're facing right now? Uh, me first, I apologize. Either or Josh. One. Okay. Both are good. So I, I'm not surprised, John, in this conversation. We did talk about generative AI and AI, and, and obviously AI has been around. I think... M- if I could say something, maybe the three of us should come together in the new year because the this year is is ending rapidly and actually dedicate maybe our next topic because I love being with you guys is is AI and we should spend some time on that. I'm not surprised. I think most of this audience is a little bit tighter into things that they're trying to solve in the next year. 
So how do I move to S4? How do I get the most? What is this thing called BTP? What what does clean core actually mean? What what am I doing with my S4? How do I move off of ECC? So I think this is weighing heavily on this group. So I don't know this is a group that necessarily is is trying to interpret and understand AI. Now, I think over time, this will become front and center. Uh, you know, Jurgen, for a couple minutes, talked about Jewel. Uh, Microsoft talked about Copilot. So we did have touches of it in there. So it was there. But it wasn't the preeminent um, you know, thrust of what we were trying to do, nor do I think it will be for the next couple of years, because we still have a large customer base that needs to move off of ECC to some sort of platform of the future. And that's a lot of heavy lifting, and that's a lot of complexity that needs to be done. And I think that's what this event is meant to do, is to address that. Now, if AI can help accelerate that, if AI can simplify that, we should absolutely be talking about some of those opportunities. But- Right now, it's about, hey, I, I have a multi-year, five-year, 10-year, 15, 20, 30-year instance of SAP running on ECC or instances like most customers. How do I consolidate? How do I simplify? How do I move forward? And I think that's that's a lot of work. And customers are, are wanting to talk about that. And that's why there's a lot of peer-to-peer going on. Yeah. And that was absolutely my sentiment as well. And you know, I think, I think in, in, if I can summarize the conversation that I had with customers, uh, specifically with this question of AI versus everything else, they came for for the other stuff. They came because they have a pragmatic need to fix a problem, to get ready for, you know, eventually going to the cloud. Um, And while they're there, you know, everyone has to kind of at this point kick the tires on AI because it's, you know, it's, it's there in the conversation uh, is happening at every, everything from the board on down. And so you kind of can't ignore it. And if you're, you know, you're going to go back to a tech conference uh, from a tech conference to the company and report back and you don't have anything to say about AI, you're probably going to get called on it. But, but absolutely, you know, the upgrade issue, um, the, how do I, you know, how do I finesse the problem of, you know, managing, managing all these instances, as you said, how do I, I, I think I wrote about, and we talked about, you know, these cu- customers who are moving off of AS 400s. Um, there's, that's, you know, that's a big, yeah. Right. You surprised me with that, Josh. I mean, awesome. I, I hadn't heard, you know, that those four letters, numbers with a slash in between them in years. I'd spent so much of my career running away from AS400 and there's AS400 lovers and they'll probably want to throw a dart at me. But I spent a lot of my career trying to run away from that platform. And every time I turn around, it pops up again. And so for years, I hadn't heard AS400. And there were a number of stories of customers on AS400 platforms talking about moving to the cloud. And I was like, that's still here. Oh yeah. my goodness. But yeah, you. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and see, to me, that's a perfect example of the pragmat, pragmatic yeah. problems, you know, that customers have to face. You've got to, you know, you got a lot to do <laughs> with just figuring out that transition before lot. you go whole hog into anything, you know, on the sort of the top three list of, of any tech vendor, you got to be, you got to really do blocking and tackling yeah. the data and process first. So that was another interesting takeaway uh, that I think ties some of this together, which is in, in my review piece, I, I wrote this line, how is effective AI possible when our so-called transformation is stuck in data silos? Ooh. And, and I, Amen. I, is and this your grouchy part? Is this is this the grouchy this, part? I'm consistently being kind of grouchy on okay. this. I think that's my role today. But um oh. but but part part of this is is that like I just I just published my first generative AI live production use case yesterday on Diginomica and it was a it's a it's a customer facing service bot, which is fairly impressive because it's in a regulated industry. And you know, given the amount of hallucination problems and and consumer LLMs, I think it's a pretty good achievement. This company quick has pulled off, but the, 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 the interesting takeaway from that is the reason it works is because it's a very narrowly focused AI that draws from a very specific data set that in this case of this company was already very clean. And so you can certainly get started in that capacity, but when you start to expand it, it gets tough because the rest of your data isn't there. And I would just read um, to you briefly from a customer and in Josh and I session that said, uh, I was curious on your perspective on how much data cleansing is needed for AI. We did a small POC recently 
on our blueprints and fun functional specs and solution manager, just throwing them all out there and putting an AI engine on top of it. It was truly garbage in, garbage out. And, and I think that's a really potent thing because, Jeff, to your point around AI coming later, perhaps, but if, if that's going to happen, there's work to do now. And I think that, mm -hmm. that was the overriding sense I was getting from customers is that they're starting to figure out that they, they're not just going to be able to plug this stuff in and have joy and wonderful times. No. They're going to have to do some work on data that they've been putting off, which I think Josh also makes him smile a little bit because he wanted customers to do that work for a long time. Yeah. I want to, I want to re resist this incredible urge I have to dedicate this entire conversation we're having today to AI, right? But we took this thing called, you know, ChatGPT came out a year ago now, right? Just about a year. And ChatGPT grabbed the headlines right before the Thanksgiving break, right? And I don't want to get into all of that. I've got some viewpoints on that. But we took the most available model in the, in the world, the, the sum total of, of English language history and other languages, ran it into a model, and it produces really good results. Why? Because it's dealing with a lot of data over a long period of time that is not time sensitive. Shakespeare is not time sensitive, right? He's he's ethereal. He's we I don't I I can't read it, but it still makes sense today. Fairly good to results. Your, the problem is that it also yeah. soaked up Reddit, and Reddit has a lot of garbage content on it too. So. Right, but that's your point, right? Yeah. I, I think for the the standard ERP customer, right. If, if what you have is very narrow, because what you have a lot more of is, is outdated information that's not relevant and it's not time-based, there's a lot of thinking to do about turning on these models yep. and saying, hey, you know what? I want to look at product. If, if most of your products in your product catalog sitting inside SAP or Salesforce or whatever, it's not an SAP issue, is all outdated and you wouldn't want to look at it. Then you got to get it out of there. Otherwise, it's this, these models are going to are going to you know in, incorporate it. So ex another example I would give you, right? I have a file folder. It's got seventeen drafts in it, and the last the last draft is the final. AI doesn't know that the seventeen before it are junk, and it doesn't know the final one is actually the final one. So what does it do? All are the same. And so what do I get back? Eighteen versions of goo. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going to resist the urge to talk about AI this entire time because I think it's a good start mm -hmm. of a conversation. My, but, Chris, but my, my holiday about, present to both of you is let's talk about this in January. Right. Okay. Let's talk about data because data. I think, you know, that, that permeated. It's all about data. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, isn't, isn't tech connect and tech ed, isn't it really at the end of the day about data and data management hard. And yeah. And, and, and skipping over that, you know, or glossing over that and saying, let's, let's go. Let's you know. Let's go to the 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 solution to a problem that <laughs> must must have impeccable data behind it. This is you know is dog wagging the tail. Or, I mean, or at least it has at least it has enough data to gloss over the errors in the data, right? So that they don't stand out as much. Um, and that requires a lot of volume. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I wrote I wrote briefly in my. Uh, use case on this 2024 will be a revealing year for enterprise LLMs. Some may obsess over expanding the parameters, but I'm more interested in how the accuracy of this output will change in an enterprise context when home with industry and customer specific output. And that's exactly the case that SAP is trying to make. So anyhow, let's put that aside for now, because the other thing I wanted to Hard mention, to the other thing that I wanted to mention that was that I found interesting was I, uh, we, Josh and I had kind of free range, free range to like roam around, which was probably a big risk on your part. But um, we, we 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 recognize that risk, and that's not going to repeat in twenty four, yeah. five, or six. No, <laughs> okay. no I'm yeah, kidding. We're getting, we're getting a little tagged. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're so, we're gonna have someone with you at all times. No, it's not no, a I'm bad kidding. idea. Actually. No, actually, but, I love the fact that you guys had a full range. Congratulations. Anyway, so so I crashed the the session you you all did where you did a early research reveal on your BTP data, which will be mm. coming out in 2024. And that was really interesting and it was pretty well attended. Yep. But then I went to a clean core session and it was absolute wall to wall. And I found that interesting because in the past I've run into people who have kind of dismissed clean core as SAP marketing project. So I can the amount of customer interest in that topic fascinated me in that context. What, what do you all make of like why the clean core topic was so resonant with, with people on the ground? 
I'm going to go back. I keep, I'm going to pull this out every time. I, tail wags dog. Um, I think, I think clean core has gotten so much play that if you don't, if you go to a tech, an SAP conference and you can't come back and explain why you should or shouldn't be doing that, uh, you, you, you know, you fail. Number one. Number two, it, it, it's, it is important. It's important for the data issue. We keep dancing around. And at the end of the day, you know, you're going to have to clean up a lot of stuff. You're going to have to clean your data to get the cleanest data possible. One, one great way to start is to look at what, it, what does it mean to have a clean core and standardized processes, because that's going to help you standardize your data. So it's not a bad thing to be focused on. But again, I think the interest, like the AI stuff, is, you know, this, these are, these are, we're getting, we're getting yelled at from keynote stage day in and day out about that stuff. Better know something about it. So I, I'm interested in this concept of clean core. It's going to be one of the one of the tenants of the ASUG um, community strategy in 2024, and talking about it. So I, I think we need to move it out of concept and into what are the realities and how do you as a customer what is what is the actual definition of clean core? Because I think at this point in time, I've seen a lot of. I've seen the phrase bantied around a lot. Now, I don't pay attention to everything. There could be a lot more out here that I'm not aware of, and I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. But my sense is it's a phrase without a whole lot of structure underneath it. What we want to do as ASUG in 2024 in, in collaboration with customers and SAP is be very precise on what does clean core mean? What's the definition of it? How do you know where you have it? How do you put yourself on a spectrum You know, between where am I at? How do you create a multi-year strategy around it? At the essence, right? Here's what I think. Um, question number one for every single customer out there. Where do you want to land on the innovation curve? And not innovation SAP. You know, where do you as a customer want to land on innovation? Do you want to be on the right side of the curve, which is on the, on the forefront of innovation? Or do you want to be on the left side of the curve? I apologize, my hands. I got to get my hands backwards. Um, on the left side of the curve, where you're bringing up the rear end of innovation. If you want to be on the forefront of innovation, and that's where your business wants to be, that's where your line of business peers want to be, your CEO and your board. If you want to be on the forefront of innovation, the only way to do that is clean core SaaS cloud, right? Because that's the only way you're going to be able to, in the future, adopt innovation at scale and speed that's going to get you there. Now, there's a lot of people that believe that that's unique to SAP. I am here to tell you it is not. It is consistent with where Salesforce is going, where Workday is going, where Oracle is going, where everyone is going. So it's a whole movement of software in general. If you want to be somewhere on the right side of this innovation curve, say middle to right, you have got to figure out how you get to a clean core, which also means low customization. Right, Because otherwise, if you are tripping over customization, what's going to happen to you as a customer, your time to implement and value is going to go down, your complexity is going to go up, your costs are going to go up, and you will be dragging behind everyone else. I think that is really what this is about. So for me, Clean Core is the gateway, and I segued for you, John, to innovation, to innovation, right? And I, I, since you guys, I, you know, we did the, the event in New Orleans and then I've been now talking to customers. I've been on the road like all of you have. And I sat down with a customer a few weeks ago and um, I happen to believe that highly innovative companies will be more successful over the long term than those that are not. Right. I believe that. Um, that you will win more if you are highly innovative. And the CIOs that are trying to drive innovation inside their organizations will long-term be more successful than the other ones. I had a CIO tell me, hey, I get this whole S4 thing. I just bought $10 million of hardware because I want to run in my own on-prem data center. And was surprised when I said to that individual, he was surprised when I said, that is going to set you up to be behind the innovation curve because that innovation is not coming to you. Now, maybe at some point it does. But it's not coming day one. It's not coming day 30. It will come if there's a significant enough customer demand for it 
in those scenarios. And I don't think there will be because those scenarios are getting fewer and fewer. So there's not an economic incentive for SAP to deliver top of the line forefront innovation in an on-prem world. It does not exist. And I apologize to the legacy customer base if what I'm saying seems heretical and you want to burn me at the stake for it. I get it. All I'm doing is telling you how the reality of the marketplace is evolving. However, however, may I, however, the issue is how fast you want to innovate. Totally different question. Yeah. And, Josh. And that, yeah. And, and but because that juxtaposed against the clean core requirement becomes a real innovator's dilemma, if you will, for, for the customers and particularly for the ASAP. So what's interesting to me, Josh, and, and maybe we need to go back. To, I, I, as ASAC, need to go back to the, the, the research team and ask this question. I have this hunch, if we look at the data, that the ones that are lagging the innovation curve are not the big companies that have been around for a long time, the multi-billion dollar, 10, 20, 30, 40 billion dollar companies. They have a whole set of other issues, right? But I don't hear them pushing back a cloud. They're moving. I actually think it's the mid-market customers that are pushing back the hardest, and those should be the ones those should be the ones that can innovate faster, can get there faster, and do more. Okay, and here's my, but here's my my caveat is that again, innovation is in the eye of the customer, right? Not in the eye of the vendor. I, I agree a hundred percent with that. So, if my innovation is that I'm going to go, I'm going to go suddenly go. Um, I'm a I'm a B two B company, and I'm going to do direct, you know, B two B commerce from a from a Ooh, browser wow. website. Yeah, I need to do that tomorrow. Actually, I need to do that yesterday, depending on my competitive profile. I can't wait to build a clean, clean core necessarily because that's a huge lift i might want to be looking at how do i put an e-commerce front end on the on the on the as 400s i have in the back good, good luck right i mean it doesn't work by the way no I, it I, doesn't work do that but but it's it's a the starting question is not so much as innovation my innovation is going to be the one that my vendor wants but is this is it going to make sense for me? So I 100% agree with that. For the customer, and I, I've used this example 100 times, I'll use it again, the chemicals industry conference uh, in the spring, that customer, this this company with, with, with a 1.2 million SKU database, they needed to clean that up before they could possibly go to a new commerce, e-commerce model. Yeah. The innovation starts with innovating the data and innovating the processes so that you don't recreate that. That's important. That's huge innovation for them. That's not innovation from the keynote stage. That's innovation at their pace, at their at at, at their requirement. They're gonna they want S for Hana, but they know yeah. they gotta fix this thing first. So I wondered, Josh. I'm gonna come back to my example of a few minutes ago. We're gonna get the hook, by the way. Watch out, John's John's. I spent yes. I just I just wrote it. I first of all, organizations have limited dollars. Money doesn't grow on trees, and right now money is more expensive than ever, right? And the way the economy is working, I I made a I made a decision. I had ten million dollars, and the decision I made as a CIO is to buy hardware, not invest in better ways to get to what you just said, a clean core, or figure out a way to unload customization that's slowing me down. I made a decision to perpetuate yep. the problem. We agree. Not mediate. They didn't talk to any of us before they made no. that. No, no, so. and I and I worry, I worry, I worry, I worry that there's more of them out there. One of my big like, when I look back at 23, when I do my year in review, my rewind, whatever Spotify calls it, we as ASUG need to reach more because I think there's a big population out there that just isn't. We are not reaching, and they're making these decisions. And I think we can help them make better decisions. And and I would add and I would add to that. I've talked with ASUG about this too. Is and and after this, we need to move on to two other topics. But the role ASUG needs to involve partners in this in a different type of way. And yeah, and and partners obviously can get into trouble by over marketing at times. But at, at events like this, but it's really vitally important because one of the things that customers need to understand in this context is that. Clean core doesn't mean the end of in innovation and building differentiated applications. What it means is a partner that is not addicted to customizing for the core of its revenue model that can advise you on 
what you do need to differentiate and what you don't. And the differentiation now comes in SAP's worldview through building applications onto the BTP platform that can stay modern and compatible as you upgrade. Now, the customer may decide not to use BTP, but use another environment for that. But the point is the partners need to evolve this model also. And there's not enough partners that are visible and focused on this. But there was a couple on the show floor, which were great to talk to, including a BTP focused uh, uh partner that I talked with. It was great to talk with. I wrote about them in my piece. But anyway, the point is, there's a whole conversation that has to happen around moving to this model without just becoming vanilla, because there are ways of building differentiating applications. It's just different than customizing your code base. So it's a different model. You're right. So I I think we can do better with the partners that are there. And we probably need to um, do more recruiting of partners versus letting the partners recruit us. And especially recruiting of partners that can help articulate what this journey looks like and, and, and transition also. And granted, not every partner can do this whole hog, but not customers can't go whole hog either. So the point is, we're all, we all have to have this dialogue and, and we need more partners that are actively involved in this. Anyhow, um, on, on the future of tech, this is important because I think you know, Josh has kind of been the carried this rallying flag in his posts around the importance of on the ground events. And you can certainly see that from the vantage point of the investments customers have made in ABAPers and getting these people upskilled into these new, you know, clean core BTP type models. And at Bangalore, we talked with Max Vessel on SAP education about this. It was a tremendous success, these hands on development aspects. The hands on labs were very, very popular and successful there. And with the absence of a major tech ed in the in the US, you, you kind of lose a little bit of that. But at the same time, I'm not sure you're going to get a lot of people to come to Vegas for that, especially the new SAP developers you want to attract. So the point is that the future of SAP events around this transition is a longer conversation that needs to happen. And, and Josh, to your point, there's also a business applications component to this conversation too, around these various you know, silos of business events like Success Connect and, you know, and Spend Connect and, and how to connect all these dots. But the point is on the tech side, especially, there's so much investment SAP is making on the future of SAP development. And there were a lot of announcements from Bangalore on that and the commitment SAP has made to upskilling all these developers. I mean, the numbers are pretty massive. I think Jurgen Mueller said something around, um, what was it? It was like millions of developers um, upskill 2 million professionals by 2025. There's a lot of free learning, new role-based certifications. The point is, how are you going to do that virtually? You have to have on-the-ground engagement. So Can't. this discussion isn't over yet. Tech right. Connect was a great event, but this discussion isn't over yet. So a couple things to say in, in that regard. We did do hands-on learning inside of Tech Connect in, in New Orleans. We will again do hands-on learning in 24, 25, and 26. So the the hands-on component will be part of the North American event, hands down. However, we also, I think from an ASUG point of view, and by the way, for those of you who, you know, we we as ASUG believed so much in this event and doing it for the community that we actually, you know, we, we did not make, you know, we did not make money on this event. I mean, we lost a fair amount of money on it. And that's, that's okay. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because we believed in it that much. The board of ASUG believed in that much. My leadership team did, and we did it. But if you're saying, hey, why should I be an ASUG member? Because we're putting these events on, and we need your contribution in order to make them viable over the long term. That's, a, that's an aside. Let me come back to this. The other thing I think that's true about North America, John and Josh, is this, and listener. Here in North America, the number of developers is relatively small in comparison to places like India, right? We know that over time, most SAP customers have outsourced the maintenance and the core development of SAP into offshore environments for a lot of reasons outside the scope of today why we get into that. So what we want to do in North America is be able to give leaders and people who are leading others and making decisions about technology to use enough understanding, enough hands-on to touch and feel, but we know they're not going to be hardcore developers. They're not. We want to make sure they understand how the tools should be used. So when they go and talk to their development teams, when they put metrics and, and, and KPIs in front, of their, in front of their development teams, they, they are working from a place of knowledge versus a place of guessing, right? And that's really what I want ATC to be. I want it to be that place where we can do enough hands-on to say, I got it, I understand it. Just like me, I understand enough about how to code 
but I don't do coding full time, right? Because I just, it's just not in my job description, but I know enough to do it. And that's, then that's good enough for me. So that's kind of how we think about it. So Josh, what do you think SAP needs to do? I mean, Jeff's articulated the role of Tech Connect in all of this, but what do you think SAP needs to do beyond that? First on the developer side, like what, like, like one option we discussed that I think SAP is going to get more serious about is more localized roadshows to give more hands-on labs, like bring this, bring the, bring the lab to the developer rather than try to get the developer to some big how about event. In our, but, how about in our 38 chapter meetings um, across North America? Yeah. yeah well, that well, too, but, but I want to ask Josh about the SAP side. Geographic of distribution now is a really interesting problem. And I've been sort of railing about this for, for a long, long time sitting out here in, in Silicon Valley. And we're always sort of self-referential and able to, proud of ourselves, but the fact remains that, you know, and this is what I've been telling the SAP folks forever. When I sit down with a bunch of entrepreneurs or or their fund or their funders or VCs, and, you know, I never hear anyone said, yeah, I, w- I woke up at two in the morning with this brilliant idea of, about a new, a new XYZ, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab that SAP IDE that I've gotten built on. No one ever says that. They all say Salesforce, mm-hmm. they all, you know, once upon a time, now they're looking at at the hyperscaler tool set. And I think, I think, at, you know, one place to go, and it's not just Silicon Valley, there's a lot of, you know, valleys to go to, 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 to see this, th- these ideas, because you want to get, you want to get the folks started right away early on uh, with, with that mentality. So I think SAP, and, and I've been begging them to do this for years, get out, get out into these communities where, 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 you know, you're just, you're, you're known you're known at the end as the end point uh, of of a you know of a big piece of chunk of software. You're not known as the starting point necessarily. And they've got the incubator, and the incubators are great, and SAPIO is great, but it's not at scale. So I think that's that's number one. I like what you know. I'll, I'll agree with you, Jeff. I think your chapter meetings are a great place. Um, I think they don't necessarily attract the developer. Per se, that I that may give them more of a reason for the developer to be there, Josh, to the extent that they exist, right? Yeah. And I think they exist more. So here's here's the thing about that: the average developer, probably unlikely, not impossible, unlikely to be able to travel and be away for three days at an event like ASIC Tech Connect. Most yeah. most organizations do not yield that budget. But hey, being able to go and get in my car and spend a day with my peers. Maybe yes. And, and well, the thing is well and I think, of- and, and look, I think the chapter meetings could play more of an outreach development role in dialogue with SAP for existing SAP developers. But I'm talking also about the new fangled developer that really understands how to develop uh, within the context of AI modeling and web based programming and open source languages and stuff like that. Those people are primarily in the US concentrated in different urban areas that are not accessible to that type of event where they'd be more likely to show up at like a a Stack Overflow event or a GitHub right. event or you know and and you know can SAP kind of take that to them because I'm going to make the argument that that SAP TechEd shouldn't return to Las Vegas. I'm going to make the argument that that SAP needs to fan out in a bunch of regional events in the U.S. instead, and and that the convergence needs to happen more on the Tech Connect level for like higher level individuals that need to discuss projects and stuff. But I'm going to make the argument that developers SAP wants to attract are not going to get in a plane and go to I Las agree. Vegas. And I know that's a little heartbreaking for some people, including myself, because at one point in time, SAP Tech Ed was the best enterprise event period bar none it was the best but but you know i think at some point you have to say does that really meet today's problems and challenges and i'm not sure that it does so anyway it'll be interesting to see what sap decides because we we don't get to decide that as so we're just riffing so so what what i would say john is i think you know and you agreed and josh agreed asec tech connect was the one of the better attempts, attempts is not a good word, at tech ed or one of the best versions of tech ed you've seen in a few years. And I think that's important. That's a start. That's a base to start from. So I think from your, from my point of view, ASUG Tech Connect is the new North America home for what you're sort of describing. Coupled, coupled with us as ASUG doing a much more deliberate, 
and 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 specific program locally in the chapters to do what you're describing. I think that is the answer. Um, and I think or that's kind like of the, bring the mm-hmm. partner in too, right? Hundred percent. Lean IX before the acquisition was doing these local events and bringing a huge number of AEs, good, good hardcore, you know, AEs. Well, and, and the answer also includes SAP code jam type formats and and what right. Thomas Young and Rich Hellman have done so masterfully. And we were told, and sorry, Rich and, and Thomas, if you're listening to this, we were told that, that those guys love the tour. So you, you've been volunteered uh, for the tour, I think, by numerous people. And so, and that can that can happen in conjunction with ASUG and independently I would like of ASUG. But but that's those are conversations that I think urgently need to happen and, mm-hmm. and I hope they do happen. We do a good job, not a great job. We do a great job of collaborating with SAP and doing the best job we can to not be in each other's lanes, right? So the the the, the issue we got into pre-pandemic was there were too many too many events happening or all around North America. There was too much fragmentation, and anyone could do any event at any point in time, regardless of audience. And we were at times we were walking all over each other. So what you describe, I agree with. As long as there's an alignment between SAP and ASUG, so we're not stepping on each other and we're programmatic and we're thinking through customer first to say, what are we putting in locally and making sure a code jam isn't happening two days, you know, two days before or after a, a, an ASUG chapter event. If that's happening, let's join together and do them collaboratively. It sounds simple. It isn't always that simple to do because there's different factions moving around. We don't always know everyone. But if we can do that, I mean, the, the great thing was the pandemic was the great equalizer. All events stopped that were that were face to face. Good and bad. Good and bad, right? So now we're back to a point where, luckily, right, we can restart this process. I think John and Josh, to your point, if I were to read the SCP tea leaves, they are probably more predisposed at the moment to be virtual than physical. I love that. We as an ASUG can take care of the physical thing. And I think we've come up with a good way and a very trusted way with SAP to be able to balance both together. And, and let me add, you know, and this is something John and I sort of looked at when we were, we were doing some work with, with some of the board members, including work that sort of was kind of promoting the this eventual concept of Tech Connect. And, you know, I really, I realized that the sun never sets on the SAP community, literally and figuratively. There are events going on every day of the year, practically somewhere in the world. And that's that's a you know your chapter events your you know your fellow user group chapter events that's the partner events like I mentioned Lean IX and others and you know and one of the things we you know we 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 brought up was this isn't leveraged well enough this this constant drumbeat of information and context with which to place your SAP bets it needs to be better leveraged because it's all there, you know, and I, you know, I, you and I, Jeff, have talked about the challenge to you. Let's, let's do more of those, those amazing chapters that you have and the, and the, you know, and, and the fact that people who go to chapter events, right. They're not necessarily going to get on a plane and go to, go to Vegas. So how do we, how do we tie them together across all these geographies? I think there's a lot to be done with really leveraging what, what's already there in the community. That's not being well synchronized with. Right. So I think that, I think there's two two takeaways there. One is like as SAP event leadership. If you're listening to this conversation, it sounds like a lot of dialogue is going to be needed going forward. Um, so hopefully that'll happen because there were some good conversations. I was part of some of them, and I'm sure there were plenty great of that I conversations. Wasn't part of. The second thing is if SAP is going to do virtual stuff, they need to, they need to get a lot better at it um, because it's hard virtual virtual. It's hard, but it's not impossible to do great virtual events. I'm sorry. It's possible. I've done it. I've been a part of it. I've seen it done. It can be done. It Stop. will be done. A big part of it is is realizing that that it's that there's an interactive possibility that is untapped. And yeah. and 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 that not everyone wants, but the people that want it are some of your most important people. And some of those people, by the way, are people that are not physically able or financially able to get to on the ground events and they they they've been excluded in recent months and years and that's not not smart and it's not fair so. wouldn't it be great to not just treat all of these as mutually exclusive silos right. but right. actually have them exactly feed off of each other wouldn't that be the best way then to- you would actually be have, having a conversation about community not events mm-hmm. wow 
Um, I, and that's why I actually, you know, I, I am trying to stop the word event in the ASUG organization yeah. and replace it with the word experience. And you might say tomato, tomato, but I think we've taken the word event and made it sound super duper transactional, right? I went and did an event. Congratulations. Check the box. Yeah. The experience to me has a higher degree of value because it means that we as ASUG are taking accountability for the whole journey the customer is yep. on, not just saying we went and did an oil and gas event or a utilities event. Or, as long as it's we not, are bad, not, as long as yeah. it's not a bad experience. Experience we, often has is assumed to have a positive connotation, but many we cases, as ASUG, like, and not. I can be I can be this organization's greatest critic. We prior to the pandemic kind of sort of look like a big event shop. We've stopped that. We've made a very concerted effort to redraw those lines. All right. So we're we're running out of time for the SAP innovation conversation. Yeah. So we got to get to that. So two minutes. So just on the SAP innovation conversation, I think the the thing, if I'm SAP, the thing I, I need to be concerned about is as follows. Uh we 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 rehashed a lot of this on the last podcast. So if you really want to get like the background of how this all started, I'm not going to revisit all of that. But the point is that SAP's been pretty aggressive throughout the fall about messaging around needing to be a, a rise or, and or a grow participant in order to partake of future SAP innovations, particularly around AI and Green Ledger and things like that. Yeah. And the concern for that for SAP and what I'm starting to see having talked with user group leadership, Jeff, you had leadership from a German user group, DSAG, on site. Good Tech friends Net. of ours. Um, talking with UKI SUG uh, leadership as well. The concern is that there's starting to be a customer perception amongst SAP customers that that even if they make an S4 investment, they're not going to get access to uh, innovation going forward easily or or at all. And that's a huge, huge concern that that perception is starting to happen. I don't think SAP wants that because SAP is losing track of the fact that these S4 migrations are not a given. Don't get too comfortable with the idea that every customer is going to do this. And and by the way, even if they do that, if they do a technical upgrade but invest their transformation budget elsewhere, then that's not what you want either because you're not perceived as a transformation partner anymore. So I'm getting a little bit frustrated because there's a couple of vendors that have a so-called legacy on-prem install base that are doing this thing where where to get access to future innovations, you you have to jump through all these hoops. And then there's other vendors that are like, you know what, no matter what release you're on, you can get access to all of our innovations when you need it. It might be a little more complicated at certain points. It might require, for example, in SAP's case, maybe you need to use BTP to access them. And maybe it's a little more complicated because you're on an older version. But unless there's an actual technical reason why you can't do it, I don't understand why SAP is creating these roadblocks and and saying you have to purchase this Rise thing. Not acknowledging, by the way, that Rise is not well understood by the vast majority of customers yet. I know that's shocking. Every customer knows about it now, but it's not necessarily well understood what it means and how to use it. I think SAP is in a very tricky place with this conversation, and I don't think in reality they intend to enforce all of these things. I think they are going to make it possible for customers to do these things. But my concern going forward into 2024 is that the perception started to take root that you have to jump through all these additional hoops. In other words, S4 HANA is not a shiny new shiny new innovation vehicle anymore. It's just something that you get and then you have to get more stuff. And I don't think that's what SAP wants. I, I have, it's interesting. You, I love that you brought this up, John. I have a view as follows, right? And I, I kind of foreshadowed some of this in my earlier comments today. Whose innovation are we talking about? Innovation and the definition of innovation is owned by the customer that wants to innovate. 100%. It is their timeline. It is their decision. And that decision, it's their business. They decide how to innovate. They can choose various ways to do that. The control do not yield control of your innovation agenda to one single technology partner, be that SAP, be that Salesforce, be that whoever. 100%. Right? So let me finish but, it because yeah, this yeah. is important, right? So what I object to, right, is this feeling that SAP is the bad guy for walking out and saying this. I do happen to believe that SAP, if there is a commercial model where SAP can sell licenses to access innovation, they will do it. 
I don't happen to think that this was articulated by SAP all that well at Q2, and I've said that, but I'm not about to have a meltdown over it. I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch and I'm going to listen. SAP has always been incredibly good at addressing and Christian Klein in the DSAG Annual Congress in Bremen, Germany. I was in the front row when he said this, we will leave no customer behind. I don't know exactly what that means, but I believe him. I have had one-on-ones with him where we've discussed this. First and foremost, customers, what is your innovation framework, your innovation agenda, and your innovation strategy? And then how do these technologies fit into it? And pick what you want, right? And it may require, it may require 100%, 100%, that you can't if, run 30-year-old software. 100%, but if you choose SAP innovations, like... To like your point, you, you start you start with a broad innovation strategy, but if you want to look at what SAP is doing around AI, you don't really want to be told that you need to run Rise to have access to that. You just want to have access to the AI. As a, as a, right? as a former CIO, John, I don't want to be told to do anything. I want to look at Google's AI. I want yeah, to be yeah, looking yeah. at But the at, point is the point Amazon's is that SAP, the SAP. point is that SAP's con- competitors offer AI without requiring you to enter into a hyperscaler relationship via RISE to get that innovation. That's the point. So go look at that. So, but the point is that SAP doesn't want to introduce that friction into the conversation is the point. And, and the point to your point is if SAP is really serious about this, then get the messaging right. If they are indeed going to let customers do this on a one-off basis and get access to the innovation they want, then just fix the messaging Yes. Because because I've been hearing it all fall. This wasn't just like a one time thing. There's been very very consistent this this pounding of rise as well, the way to get we, access to innovation. We see these examples, and we talk to um, you know to Jens Hungerhausen about this as well at, at, at TechNet. Companies are doing it. You want you know my favorite example. You want to do carbon accounting, and you're running twenty old ECC systems. Great, spin up a single S four Hana public cloud. There are ways to do it. Right. And, and when there's a will, there's a way. doing it. Right. And to John's point, get off the orthodoxy about thou shalt rise and only rise and say, yeah, rise, rise has certain values. We, we saw this, you know, John, John, and I talked about this at, at technical. I'm starting to compile these little tidbits of where do you actually, from a technical standpoint, you're going to do a better job with rise or without? Because that exists. But fundamentally, rise is really. The advantage for Rise is that you get to bundle software and you get an advantageous price. What's Rise? Rise is a means to an end. It is not the end in and of itself. The end is, as a customer, I want to innovate faster. Therefore, I need to be on the cloud. I need to be thinking about my software investments as software as a service. And I need to have this minimal amount of customization as possible. I'm not creating technical debt so I can move at my own chosen speed. Mm-hmm. That's my choice. If I'm going to do those three things, I can take advantage of innovation. I think the risk that SAP wandered into with this announcement in Q2 and that only innovation happens as rise is a, a whole bunch of customers went heads up. And I think we had the wrong reaction to this. A bunch of customers went heads up and they should have gone, hmm, interesting. You just told me I need to go look other places. I don't think SAP wants that. What I don't like is the is this kind of sense that, oh my God, the only way I can innovate is through Rise, and now I'm stuck as a customer. No, you are not. Mm, perhaps, sure. perhaps an avenue, perhaps an avenue got shut down on you. Great. There's a lot of other avenues out there for you to do. Let me ask you a question, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What type of innovation do you think you will achieve if you own a 10-year-old plus iPhone? I'm gonna do. I, I can still do. I can still do some pretty. Interesting I have. Things. I have a gentleman who takes me to and from the airport when I travel all the time. He tried for a week and a half to communicate via a flip phone. When I first met him, he was a brand new driver, and he said, "If you need to get a hold of me, I use a flip phone." In two weeks, he had an iPhone. He doesn't really understand how to use it. He's getting better at it. And why? Because he pretty much figured out people were sending him text messages to his flip phone. He couldn't answer them. So, but, 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 Innovation, Jeff, but, gentlemen. but Jeff, but Jeff, to your point, 
you can't modernize your entire infrastructure no. at once, so you have to pick your spots. And two of SAP's major competitors, and I won't name them now, are doing something which I would argue is going to be better rewarded by the market. And what that is, is that no matter what release of the software you're on, if you're eligible to run cloud services that address a specific problem, like say financial payments or whatever, then you can do that. You can consume it as a cloud service without entering into any kind of massive hyperscaler management agreement. You just consume the service you want and gradually you're consuming more and more cloud services and you're modernizing your architecture at your own pace at the way in which you choose. And I think ultimately that's where SAP wants to be too. Now, now, I will say that all of those vendors are also educating their customers on exactly your point, which is specifically around artificial intelligence. You can't have these data silos, and so much of what the good stuff that happens around AI does involve public cloud. And so it is very, very difficult to have these complicated legacy architectures and 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 experience some of that innovation. So right. it's an education as well, but but I think you want to just make it really possible for customers to choose. And if SAP wants to make the case that the best possible way to consume their innovation is through Rise, I have no problem with that case. In fact, I think it should make it aggressively if they want to. But it's very, very different to do that in the context of customer choice versus this perception that customers have received that there is no choice. Let me, let I, me I just think, I think you know, here, here's, here's the interesting thing about where this plays out, John, is... We as customers, classic customer thing, want our cake and eat it too, right? So we want access to all the innovation. We don't want to have to pay any incremental fees for it. And I appreciate the line in the sand, right? I want all the innovation. I don't want to have to make any concessions that my tech platform is outdated. It's brittle. I have I have layered on 100 million different customizations. None of that matters. SAP, give me all the innovation I want for free so I can gobble it down like a like an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's not the way it works. We as customers are going to have to concede some points. Like back to my point about mm -hmm. if you want to send text messages in today's world, sending them on a flip phone with, with 10 buttons, one through zero, is probably not the most efficient way to do it. Could you do it? Sure you can. Should you do it? Probably not. Same exact metaphor. Ladies and gentlemen, as customers, we need to start making a move to these future platforms. And if we make some concessions, we will be met along the way. Can I, can I, I, need, I think it's really important to add a problem SAP has with its rise messaging, with, which, which well, is that yeah. insofar as that concept is valid, no innovation without rise, it only applies fundamentally to S4. So having been, been to Success Connect and Spend Connect, and having talked to folks about Katana X, for instance, none of that requires you. You don't have you. You can get all that cool stuff mm -hmm. out of out of the ISBN business unit or out of the HXM business unit without S for Hana and without Rise. There's a ton of innovation there. None. I think. I that. think, Josh, to your point, when there's a will, there's a way. If I, as a customer, have a absolute pedal to the metal interest in innovating that's what i want to do i will figure out a way to do it i yeah, can do it short term about, long -term. about figuring out this is how sap is tripping over itself with its own messaging because you sit down you go to these conferences yeah and no one's talking about rise they're talking about let's let's do business network that's not a rise thing it's there's a little piece of business network you can get if you buy rise but that's not the point you want to innovate in the business network world you want to innovate in the next generation procurement for you know for for you know contingent labor that's not a rise contract there's no rise going on there this piece rise s for hana marketing is hijacked the whole concept of innovation away from all these other brilliantly and interesting right things. then well, we and as customers actually, bring it back well right and and, and look look i mean customers need to assume responsibility to Jeff's point, for their own modernization plans, for sure. But I think it's also fair for customers to expect that the messaging that they receive from their vendor is accurate to their circumstance. Yeah. And and in this case, it's very confusing because you keep hearing on the back channel that actually you could access some of this stuff through BTP. That would not be a problem. Well, if it's not a problem, then just say. Just say customers have choices because the whole point is... SAP wants to be a customer's transformation partner in the long term. That should be the I goal. Hope so. 
And, and, and I think that's what you really want. And so let's talk about that. Let's say we're your transformation partner. The best way to do that is through our managed services programs. But regardless of what you choose, we're going to be there for you. No matter what you're running, we're going to help you. But, but to Jeff, Jeff, there could be a little tough love in that message around, look, 100%. look hey, some, of the, some of the AI you want to do, you're not going to be able to do this on, on an old version of S4 that's heavily customized. And, and here's why. And and right. I think that is welcome, but your iPhone thing doesn't really work in the Rise oh, con. It doesn't. Man. It doesn't work in the Rise context. It, it no, it's not because there's Rise. That implies that that there's technical issues if you're not on Rise, and there's not. There's I have yet to hear a single technical reason why you have to do it that way. But but where it does apply is in something that I was told by by um, a couple of SAP leaders around how certain access to some of the green ledger stuff that they're doing has a version and kernel dependency with a certain S4 thing. And that's where your example comes up, where you find yourself on an old thing that actually you can't consume a certain software. It happens all the time, like you're saying, like you're on an old phone and you can't run Zoom anymore. And you're like, crap, I better get a new phone because I can't. Yeah, and there are going to be things or, like that, but rise. Not gonna, but but rise is not that. That right. That's or the thing. or you know what? Guess what? I'm going to do Zoom without a camera, right? Because my system doesn't support it, right? I mean, yeah. that's okay. That's okay. I, 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 let me be clear. I you know I am not I am not towing the SAP party line on this. I I I happen to listen. We talked about this. I happen to listen to Christian's Q2 earnings call with a transcript and him speaking at the same time side by side. And said, he said, what? What? Right? Yeah. But ultimately, John, you said something incredibly important that I fundamentally believe in. You use the word market. We as customers can make decisions about how we want to deploy technology. They yep. may not be the best decisions. They may not be the most optimal. I might argue that I don't want to actually use SAP's Green Ledger system. I don't know enough about it. I have choice and I should wield that choice. And the market ultimately will lead SAP to the direction it needs to go because they will not be able to monetize. They'll be penalized for the decision and they will ex they will they will give ground. I happen to believe if there's enough market demand for a particular innovation, mm -hmm. SAP will figure out a way to make that innovation available to the people who can access but, the most. But Jeff, that's, never, a, that's, that's a hard road to take though, which is like, oh man, let me just try this. And, and, and then when I get spanked enough times by the market, I'll do the right thing. That, that's, I don't recommend that as a business no, strategy, No, I, by I the don't way. love it either, it, John. It, uh -oh, it we just, lost Josh. It, just we lost Josh. It, it, it would be like saying, saying for ASUG, like, just go run some mediocre events and have them be unsuccessful. No. Then you'll finally learn the successful. No, yeah, don't but do we that. Have. No, no, but we right, have. But, and we learn. Right. So why didn't SAP learn? They should have learned this. This was obvious. This was I so agree. obvious. They could have backed agree. off from this. They could have backed off from this and they could have but, like, but okay. So, so Jeff, Jeff, recently I had a conversation with someone at SAP and what I said to them was, cause, cause I said the UKI sug reaction to your stuff was so predictable. And, and and I told you months ago, and I was hardly the only one, that there are some things you could do to adjust your messaging that would have avoided so much of that. I agree. And 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 it could have just saved you the headache of that. Mm -hmm. And and look, but it's not the end of the world. Gives there, us something to talk about. It it does, but it's like silly drama. It's it not. Is. It, it's silly. Well, it's silly drama stuff. And, and and UK 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 Sug continued the drama versus. You know, just saying. You know what? We'll but figure it think, out. But they think they're they think they're advocating for their customers, and 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 you know, you may disagree with their tone and their approach, but they are trying to advocate for their members. And and the same mm -hmm. thing with the German user group, who, by the way, are so even are we more, as ASUG? No, exactly. But but it, but that doesn't mean that you're going to have to do it the exact same way. There's still there. What's going to happen is everyone's going to enter into a dialogue with SAP and work it out. You know, um, but the German user group, by the way, is even more upset than than UKI sug about this because they were promised certain things around on prem S4 innovation and now they're not seeing those things. And look, to your point, maybe those promises should never have been made because maybe some of that stuff can't happen in an older on premise environment. But the point is that you can save yourself a whole lot of trouble by just communicating on this stuff in a different way, and then you don't have so much of this 
stuff to wade through is all. I okay. agree wholeheartedly. I, I'd yeah, like to defend SAP for one tiny little bit because one of the okay. things that's shocking. What, we promised to be less than an hour, an hour podcast. Yeah, two minutes. I know. 104. Okay. We, we got to wrap this up, folks. Okay. Gosh, and, and, say, one of the things I learned at TechNet that surprised me was how many customers were behind on their S4 HANA upgrades. And, behind. And, and that was shocking because that sort of breaks the model. Uh, so to a certain extent, I can see why SAP is in a panic because they got these folks, these early adopters on S4, and now they're just doing the same thing they were doing with ECCs and not upgrades. So I, I, I'm going to give SAP a, a pass on, the, on some of the panic button pressing they've done around this subject because these customers got to get off their butts and, and, and stick. I, I have a solution to this. I have an absolute solution to this. You know what customer base? We absolutely can support you whatever place you are, whatever technology you're on, we will support you with an innovation life cycle. Your pricing might be different because it's more complex for us to support older technology than newer technology. Your price points are different. If you're interested, let's talk. And don't don't yell at us when you can't get innovation X, Y, or Z because you're running four revs behind. I, I always, 100%. You, you, you put a wall up in front of me, I'll figure out a way to go around it, underneath it, through it, over it. I love it. Bring it on. A hundred percent, but a hundred percent. But what SAP I think needs to double down on that they have not done is to say S4 HANA is your innovation platform. It is. It's it is. It's how do not, we help you get there? Exactly. It's not it's not just just something that has now been supplanted by Rise and AI. Yep. It's actually part of the overall platform. And you know, I I, I do want to say because I look look, the one of the reasons that I took the tone that I did during that conversation is because Jeff took a different stance and I wanted to bring out the whole argument. I, so I, I want, I think I, I actually appreciate John that, that we have had this debate. This is a good debate, right? It, it's and this is the kind of thing that, that I, I do want to say one thing and I say about SAP, which is SAP's really promoted the opportunity to have these kinds of dialogues. And, and I, and I happen to agree with a lot of it, what SAP is trying to do with AI around responsible AI. And I like the clean core vision because it does allow customers over time to get to where they need to go. I think SAP's handled that very well. So I, I, I just, I, in this particular debate, I, I took the stance I took because I felt I needed to represent those points of view, uh, especially because the other user groups in question feel differently than, than Jeff does about this. But, but, I, the point, I think but, we but ultimately... Group. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. But but ultimately I do want to say that I think I think what what the user groups are doing right now is incredibly important because not just for this issue but the urgency of this debate shows you how important these issues are for customers right now. And you know, hopefully this dialogue will continue into the next year because we were planning on cutting this podcast off, but you have to have this conversation. <laughs> you know. Here's the thing. Um and I I, I want to give our res our listeners a break and I need a break too. Um, different type of break. But here's the thing, right? If if I felt if I look at the if I look at the landscape of where we're going, we talk about cloud SaaS, low code, blah, blah, blah. And SAP was saying something like, hey, you know what? We think you all should be running on a on a 1920s IBM mainframe. And it's not inconsistent, it's not in lockstep with where the where the market is going. I have a very different viewpoint on this. But I think SAP is actually moving in lockstep with the rest of the providers, maybe not perfectly, and maybe not all the I's are dotted or T's across, but they're moving in the right general direction with this. And we as customers need to understand that this is the direction that technology is going. And if we want to meet our business leaders, our business peers on the same front, because here's the thing, John, here's what I am worried about. And Josh. I'm a CEO now. I used to be a CIO. Guess what? If I don't innovate as a CIO, my line of business peers will innovate around me. They don't need me either. So as a CIO, yeah. I better figure out how I want to innovate. Back yep. to my conversation. I bought $10 million worth of on-prem hardware. Congratulations. I don't think that your line of business peers are going to love that investment, and they're probably going to go and do something around you. And if you don't think they are, congratulations. You're living in a fantasy land. Nice stuff, Jeff. Okay, so, okay. so 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 Josh, I want you to bring us home because Jeff and I got into it pretty good there. So bring I us. I think home, we had a great debate. Bring us home to the end of this. What, what do you make of all this? Where where should we take this from here? This is the final word. The final word. I think that we, I think that I, you know. I honestly think that that we've said this, and I'll just repeat it here. Innovation is in the is 
is in the mind and the reality of the customer. And that's what everyone needs to focus on, including the customer. And and I think you said this a second ago, down, the customer has to take responsibility too. Um, I think the partners have to come in and step up and be allowed to step up and, and t- take some of the leadership position that they can. And together, you know, we could really I- ideally break apart any kind of concept of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy means one way. There is no one way. There is no you one way. to do this the way it makes sense. But you and, own the innovation agenda as a customer, not SAP. And, and that, if, if everyone can stick to that, and really focus on customer success and not not those other KPIs like stock price, you know, I think I think there, there's a hell of a lot of really positive stuff that can happen out of this ecosystem that, that can't happen anywhere else. Great right, conversation. That's the last word. Thank you. Well, maybe we'll do this again in January. That went we off should the do rails in the best way possible. Last so. second time. Thank, thanks, right. guys. Thank Later. you. Thanks. Thank you.